Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vincent Horn, back again for another interview. And I'm joined today over Google Hangout with our special guest, Alex Sujung Kim Pang. Alex, it's awesome to have you here. Thanks so much for taking the time to uh, chat with the geeks. Oh, it's a pleasure. As all sort of very, very good to be on the show. Yeah, and and definitely in terms of geek, we were talking about before the interview. Um, you sort of consider yourself more on the geek side of the Buddhist geek spectrum. Um, I do want to get into that with you and sort of hear a little bit about your background with both. Um, mm -hmm. That said, I, I will sort of share a little bit to sort of introduce people to your background and kind of where you're coming from. Um, first to say that you've just recently released a new book. It uh, came out August 20th, so um, this is something you've been working hard at, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. it's called uh, The Distraction Addiction. Here it and is. the subtitle's oh, awesome. Oh, there it is, right there. There it is. I and should the, do the rest of the interview just like this. There you go. I, yeah. I, I stand behind my book. Literally. That's right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, and, and I love the subtitle. It's getting the information you need and the communication you want without enraging your family, annoying your colleagues, and destroying your soul. You, you know, it's amazing that the Little Brown Art Department was actually able to get the whole subtitle on here instead of having to, you know, run it around the back or go to a second volume. So, you know, it's the, or, you know, the, first, the first way that you can see of how you know how much energy Little Brown itself put into this. It's awesome, and I also want to mention for people that are interested in finding your work online, um, you are available uh, on Twitter. You you're tweeting some mm -hmm. awesome stuff. I love uh, seeing what you're tweeting, and it's at uh, at Ask Pang, and That's then right. also um, you're blogging at contemplativecomputing.org. That's right. Which is a which is a great um, great little title, contemplative computing. <laughs> So um, we're going to explore that, uh, but first sure. I wanted to kind of uh, hear a little bit about your background, your history. Um, I was wondering if you could share a bit about your um, dual background in both technology and then also meditation, contemplation. Mm -hmm. I know technology is something that you've been immersed in for quite a long time, and meditation is maybe something that you picked up a little later in life. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have, so sort of my background is sort of... Uh, I actually started out my life as uh, doing history of science and technology, and so I did a, a PhD in that, and then taught that for a few years, and then after that went into sort of publishing. Just to, just at the point where sort of um, publishing was starting to recognize that the internet was changing all kinds of aspects of uh, the way that people wrote. Um, the way that the kind of economics of, in my case, reference publishing. I was um, the managing editor of Encyclopedia Britannica for several years. Um, kind of in between the time when um, of the the era of Encarto, you know, which came on those or of you yes. know, the DVDs. Um, I remember in between, those. In between that period and Wikipedia, so it was a really very, very interesting time to be working for uh, a 200 plus year old sort of institution. And so uh, it, for me that was interesting because it was everything I had read about you know, the history of media and social change playing out right in front of me. Wow. And yeah. Um, and so after several years of that, um, I relocated back from Chicago, where Britannica is based, to California, and have been here ever since, and have worked primarily as a technology forecaster and futurist, which is really just the same. It's the same thing as being an historian of science, only you're talking about the future rather, you're talking in the future tense rather than in the past tense. The kinds of questions you're interested in, the tools you use, the issues that concern you, they're really all the same. Um, and so I've spent a long time thinking about or studying how people use technologies and sort of the worlds that they make with them, both sort of, you know, the, uh, the, the physical worlds of, sort of networks and offices and structures, but also the kind of psychological networks as well. And you know, their ideas about what technology ought to do how new technologies affect the way that we think about the world or about ourselves, 
um, how we imagine what the future can be like. And I got into a contemplative practice a, oh, about five or six years ago because you know, when you're working as a futurist, a lot of your work is very project-based, it's very client-focused, um, you're always thinking a lot more about the next thing than the last. And after several years of doing that, I was finding that, like the character in Nick Carr's book, The Shallows, that it was really feeling like it was having an effect on my ability to just remember basic stuff and to think complicated thoughts. Now, I would go into you know, a room to get something, and by the time I got there, I would have to remind myself what it was that you know that I was doing. Mm. And you know, for someone who had spent his entire life basically, um, you know, sort of getting you know getting ahead on sheer uh, sort of sheer brain power as opposed to self discipline or anything, this was really a pretty scary prospect. And so. One of the and so as part of sort of my effort to and really to kind of take a step back and rebuild sort of my mind and my attention and to figure out the degree or if, um, you know to figure out the more general problem of how to develop and or kind of maintain maintain attention and focus in the digital age. Um, I started meditating, and you know, and it's something that I mean it was one of several things that I was doing that was you know much better for me than um, you know, trying to sort of read massive numbers of articles while you know in line to get on a plane to go somewhere to do a workshop for clients. Um, it's an interesting way to live, but not necessarily you know sort of. A, a, a terribly sustainable way of life, and you know what I wanted to figure, or sort of really what I sort of what I wanted to answer was the question of was this kind of mental state, this kind of perennial perpetual distraction, sim, you know, either something that was now sort of inevitable and inescapable in today's digital world, or was it something that sort of we could, you know, sort of we could exert some control over? And that's where the idea about contemplative computing was born. And, and really, it's about um, what you can do to sort of change your relationship with information technologies, with you know, smartphones and social media, so that you go from being of perpetually of distracted and mentally fractured the way that I felt I was to being more focused and mindful. Um, and so I think that sort of my, uh, you know, in a way, my sort of engagement with, uh, sort of with, uh, sort of with contemplative practices or with Buddhism flows very much from that. Um, you know, more recently, and when I was working on the book, I also started. I kind of discovered um, writers like Thomas Burton and the great Jewish theologian Abraham Heschel, um, who wrote a phenomenal book about the Sabbath. And so I realized. Sort of, once I was kind of deeply, sort of fairly far along this road, that you know what I was, sort of you know, what I had gotten into was a set of practices that were you know, by no means exclusively Buddhist, sure. but which you know had sort of parallels in um, other faiths as well, but which for various kind of curious historical reasons today seem more accessible via Buddhism than through. You know, or Catholicism, or or Protestantism, or or or, you know, or kind of other channels, um, and so you know, and I continue a sort of regular sort of meditation practice, and I've also sort of you know, come to see the ways in which things like um, kind of everyday practices can also sort of can also take on a sort of contemplative quality to them if designed the right way. Mm. So um, you may, from time to time, in the background, see a see a um, yellow Labrador tail moving back and forth. The, the dog is in the office with me, as he usually is. But um, I have you know, we go out for long walks every evening, and I found that you know, rather than you know take the iPhone and headphones and you know, plug into the news, that 
that's actually a great opportunity to you know, slow down a little bit and maybe try to experience the world the way that a, you know, the way that a dog does. You know, very, very much in the moment. Um, I can't smell as well as he can. <laughs> you know, on the other hand, he smells terrible. So um, <laughs> that's really that's really okay. But uh, but that there are you know just as I argue in the book that there are opportunities for being more mindful about technology and thus being more mindful through technology. You know, so so too is that the case with other kinds of everyday activities. So um, that's the so you know, the long answer to the question is I, I is that I'm much more geek than Buddhist, um, and or, um, and and I suspect probably always will be. So nice. And I was curious too. You said you picked up the practice to kind of um, address the issue of this fractured sense of attention. Yeah. Did did it help? Yes, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think. You know, there were there were a whole bunch of other things that were going on at the same time. You know, sure. sort of, I'd been in this job where I'd pretty much done everything that I could do two or three times. And you know, when you are a futurist, being in a job that doesn't seem to have a future is a kind of painfully ironic one. Um, and so, you know, that brought a certain amount of baggage as well. But I think that you know that just you know, um, you know what I find is that if I can think about nothing for even a second, and in you know sitting for you know sitting for forty five minutes or an hour, I still feel like I'll have you know a few minutes where I'm really kind of deeply into sort of something a, a kind of mental state that's very different from sort of my everyday life, right? You know, the first ten minutes, your body is just kind of settling itself down, or at least mine is. And then there's that phase where the monkey mind is kind of, you know, is still kind of struggling. Um, you know, it's trying to get you to think about your Netflix queue or snow cones or, um, you know, sort of how many accelerometers are there in Google's new Moto X cell phone. Um, <laughs> you know, and then eventually it kind of, you know, eventually it sort of fights itself sort of into exhaustion. But you know, I find that if I can think about nothing even for a very short period of time, I can think about, you know, the one thing I need sort of to deal with, you know, be it an essay you know, or something for a client, I can think about that one thing for a very long time. Um, so I think that it has been, you know, and I can tell when or if I don't do it for a while, you know, I start to feel like or if I begin to lose that edge. And you know, fortunately, though, it's a, it is one that you, know, you can get back. So you know, that's the good news. Yeah, and for for anyone who's had a meditation practice and and or who has one, I think what you're saying is definitely familiar uh, familiar news. Good. Um, so so getting more into the sort of content that you explore in the book and that you're exploring mm -hmm. just generally, and I thought. There's a few topics in particular I thought would be fun to explore with you. The first one, which uh, we had a nice Twitter exchange about at one point, was uh, around this uh, topic that you said uh, recently to me that you have a bit of an allergy to, which is technological determinism. Um, I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could say a bit about technological determinism, um, why it's and also why it's problematic. You know, why you sneeze every time it comes into view. <laughs> um, what what is this and why is it a problem? Well, okay. So the fundamental idea with, the, or the simplest sort uh, of uh, this definition of technological determinism, is of that um, human uh, or human history is determined by the course of technologies. That sort of you know, and that um, the ways in which technologies come into being. Um, make their way into our lives, affect our world, follows a kind of internal logic that is separate from and in a way kind of inaccessible to human experience. So that, and the problem with this is, okay, is you know, Wolfgang Pauli once described a criticism of quantum mechanics as so bad it's not even wrong. 
Um, and I would say that that determine that sort of the technological determinist sort of position is both wrong and bad. Wrong in the sense that if you go back to you know, if you look at the history of technology closely enough, what you see is a million little decisions, and sometimes some very big ones or very consequential decisions that sort of that people make in response to immediate circumstances, whether it's economic stuff, whether it's kind of um, you know, project politics, whether it's design sensibility, that give shape, that you know, push technologies in one direction versus another. Afterwards, sort of when something is a roaring success, say, it might seem like Oh, you know, it was always perfectly clear from the outset that um, the technology ought to look like this, or should have these properties, or would be used in this way. But when you're in the middle of it, you know, when you're building these things, or very early on in their history, all that stuff is still very, very fuzzy, very unclear. Likewise, if you look at, you know, the uh, the other really important thing that I think technological determinism short circuits is the degree to which we as users have power and agency over our devices, over our technologies, and the degree to which we are able to shape those interactions and, rat and to have them serve our needs or our purposes rather than to have them serve the purposes of their creators or the uh, service providers to which they are sort of still attached via invisible or wireless or contractual connections. So, in a, in a, and in the work that I'm doing now on contemplative computing, I think this is especially important because you know we have this uh, sort of sense that our, our devices are both. Um, inescapable and inevitable, right? That if you want to be sort of a reasonably modern person, then you have to have you know, things like this. And you know, they've got to be with you all the time and always on. And that, and that sensibility can close off the recognition that there are all kinds of ways that you can use these things. You know, ways that, it, it, you know, small things that you can do to turn them, let's say, from constant interrupters to defenders of your attention um, to very big things that you can do in the way of sometimes you know, turning, them all, turning them all off for extended periods while you, you know, escape to the mountains um, or, you know, as, as, or somewhere else. Um, and I think, you know, there is this, uh, and the fact that they are so much a part of our lives, and you know, it's amazing to think that the smartphone barely even existed seven years ago. Right. Right. You know, I remember being at a conference maybe in 2006 and that was sponsored by Nokia, and all the panelists got Nokia N95s, which at that time were... You know, the coolest thing in the world. Um, you know, to go from seven years ago, those things barely existing, to to them being incredible, you know, for, you know, uh, or for many of us being uh, sort of omnipresent, you know, and always on, give, uh, contributes to a sense that they are sort of inescapable, and that they are, and that their presence in our lives is such a good thing that um, you know, our lives would be made much, much worse by their absence. There's a great uh, writer, tech, technology writer in Seattle named Mona, uh, named uh, Monica Guzman, who you know makes the point that taking digital sabbaths is like having the ocean is like having an ocean recede. Um, it's like having low tide. And then what happens with, sort of, with our high-tech lives is that um, the waters kind of slowly come up so that you don't even really sort of notice them. 
and it's only you know, and they bring all kinds of you know all kinds of things with them um, sort of unspoken assumptions sort of you know habits that you just get into without sort of realizing and that it's only when you let those waters recede that you're able you know, to see down to the bottom and to see all the other things that have come with sort of this te technological tide. So that's why I think that uh, uh, that determinism is really problematic because it close because um, it is it runs counter to sort of the real experience that sort of goes into the making of technologies and it closes off as users our sense of agency and independence and power over devices that often have play a very very big role in our lives and to the degree that we make ourselves sort of less capable of sort of managing those relationships changing them uh, to the to the degree that sort of we give over our uh, sort of our autonomy and our attention to um, uh, to these technologies and to whoever it is who uh, sort of who designs and operates them, um, we make ourselves just a little bit less human. So, you know, other than that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with technological determinism. <laughs> Good, good way to end that. You know, I was as you're describing that. You know, I was thinking about some of the um, some of the things like, for instance, search engines. Uh -huh. I, and I'm I'm curious if you could kind of help me sort of differentiate the difference between um, kind of seeing the necessity of a certain kind of technology that would arise in response to certain conditions. For example, mm -hmm. when all these computers start networking together and there's enough of them, there's enough information out there that suddenly it's like, whoa, wait a second, we need to find a way to kind of be able to search through this and, and, right. and kind of pull up what we need because there's so much data out there. So you could kind sure. of look back and say, oh, well, of course a search engine would arise because that, mm -hmm. you know, was is... And so, so it seems like you're saying that's not necessarily deterministic to say to look back and and see why something would arise but what's the difference between sort of seeing that kind of perspective and then also the the difference between that and saying well there's variation in how like google approaches the search engine what kind of algorithms they use you know how okay. it works versus yahoo or bing like i can see on a feature level or on a surface on not even a surface level because some of those decisions are very deeply affect the nature of it um, but like how could we have avoided with the rise of the internet some sort of services that allow people to kind of make sense of things and, and is that isn't that a kind of determinism in a certain way at least retrospectively well I mean in the sense that okay, okay so is demand determinism um, you know I, I suppose my you know my first answer is that if you go back to or the early history of of search engines. You know, Yahoo wasn't a search engine, right? Yahoo was a directory. It's a portal, um, right? It was a portal. And, you know, sort of in you know, for that brief glorious period when everybody was a portal. Um, every, you know, sort of Alta Vista was a portal and um Excite at home was a portal and we were all executed, you know. You and I probably were portals and we, you know, burned through millions of dollars and just don't even remember. Um, <laughs> so you know, okay, so sort of, now, okay, so the idea that, um, let's say technologies reflect different kinds of company strategies that themselves reflect particular, you know, particular kinds of technical skill or sort of um, patents that sort of a company has, and that there's a relate, and that sort of one company will pursue sort of one strategy because of its patent portfolio and another because of its, okay, that. I suppose, in a way, that that's a kind of contingency that sort of makes a certain amount of sense, right? And that there's, um, uh, or that's relatively, that's sort of easy to understand. Now, is there, in some larger sense, a, you know, was there a a kind of telos that was unfolding right. um, that through the kind of logic of the internet? Sort of demanded that someone sooner or later was going to come up with a search engine. Uh, yeah, uh, I think my answer is maybe, and but I'm not sure how much it matters. 
you know, I mean, I think that sort of there were you you could make you could make a similar argument about lots of different kinds of important technologies, but when all, but I think you know, again, for me, when all is said and done, sort of the big uh, the big question is what effect does it have on users' abilities to recognize sort of their capacity to sort of act as free agents within you know sort of within the system, and so does. You know, sort of does the, you know, did um, Doug Engelbart or Tim Berners-Lee set in motion sort of a series of events or lay a groundwork that would have led sooner or later to Larry and Sergey, or you know, in alternate you know alternate history timeline, Larry Larry one and Sergey one, or Larry two and Sergey two coming up with something that is Google-like, maybe. And you know, when we get to the point where we can run history back and do experiments on it, hmm. then you know, or if, you know, then we'll know. Um, but I think that you know, it's enough to be able to say that um, we can, you know, even if even if technology has some kind of teleological bent to it, you know, if the arc of you know, even if even if the technological Arc of the universe bends bends toward uh, toward Google. Then, even still, you know that's uh, that is a world that has a lot of oppor- has a lot of contingency and opportunity for the exercise of free will and the construction of sort of meaning on sort of on all our parts. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing a little bit about. That sort of perspective, I, I found consistently that the uh, the, the t- deterministic perspective uh, it, it seems to be strong in, in different sectors of the geek culture, you know, yes. the humanist world, and you know, in various you know Wired magazine, you know, think th- there's certain places that you just see that kind of attitude or philosophy sort of infusing the conversation in a way that mm-hmm. it's difficult to identify sometimes. The force is strong with this one, yes, and <laughs> even. You know the interest. Sort of the interesting thing living here is that even with people who spend their days, you know, arguing with fellow engineers about you know, or about feature sets, or with interaction designers about you know what the icon should look like and what kind of user model we have, or marketing people about who this thing should be marketed to, even they share a kind of sense that. There's a kind of disconnect between the stories that they tell ab- about uh, about their daily life and work, which is all about you know kind of sort of politics and negotiation and solving problems in unexpected ways, versus the kind of higher level story that you tell about how you know sort of about how technologies come to play a role in our lives, and part of it may be that. If you fight enough of these battles and you kind of lose enough of them, um, that you have a sense that um, your own agency as a designer is you know, bounded by the needs of companies or of you know, marketing, um, or that you know, it's such a familiar story that you know, even when you have plenty of evidence in your own you know your own daily life and your own resume. It's really, it's still really easy to default and to think that, well, you know, the rest of the world really does operate this way. Um, you know, the particular, the particular battles that I see, the decisions that I'm involved in, seem really small compared to these right. gigantic systems in which we all live. So, yeah, yeah, and that, and that seems like the tension that you know that that exploring this whole thing of determinism brings up is this feeling mm-hmm. of, you know, to what degree is my agency or autonomy m- make a difference in the midst of these really right. powerful systemic yeah. forces? You know, the last thing is that there are plenty of people who work very, very hard to make things look inevitable. Um, you know, hmm. you think, for example, you know, the the, the really benign example would be um, Moore's law. The law that says that processing power roughly doubles every 12 to 18 months, right? Um, 
sort of Gordon Moore gave a talk about this in what 1963 or so. Arguably, Doug Engelbart had even seen it in the late 1950s, and ever since, computing power has followed Moore's law. Well, one of the reasons computing power has followed Moore's law is that Intel, especially, and AMD and other companies have spent absolutely enormous sums of money and sort of person years making sure that uh, that Moore's law continues to hold. Um, Moore's law around here is treated kind of like the speed of light. It's you know it's not just an observation about progress or about the falling cost of processor speed. It is like a physical constant, and it is unthinkable that Moore's law would ever you know would have, would ever cease to be. Now there is now so. That, I think, is a relatively benign example of kind of determinism brought to life. The idea that um, uh, that your life is made better if you share everything about it in near real time with, ev sort of with everybody you're connected to on my network is an example of determinism that is you know, a little less benign. You know, sort of your friends are all here, um, there were, and, and as, the owner, as the owner of this social media site, it is, in, it is very much in my interest for you to communicate a lot with them because there are all kinds of interesting things that I can learn about all of you that I can then analyze and parse and sort of resell to advertisers if you believe that the default state in your life should be sharing through me. And that's an example, I think, of sort of technological determinism that turns into a sort of behavioral determinism and at that point becomes really, really, really problematic. So, um, you know, yes. however, you know, once again, Aside from all of that, there's really nothing wrong with the idea of technological determinism. Okay, great. And and so, I feel like part of this conversation and this exploration is really uh, going back to the contemplative kind of perspective. Not that there's mm -hmm. one. Of, not that there's one of them, but going back to a more contemplative perspective. Um, part of the question that arises, and I think contemplatives have been they've been looking at this with the technologies of their ages s since since the dawn of contemplation uh, right. which is how do we engage if we're trying to live some sort of some degree of a contemplative life mm -hmm. some degree of taking time to I investigate this inner experience of of consciousness of being conscious mm -hmm. um, of identity of you know the myriad sensations that make up our our lives mm -hmm. um, how do we relate to these different technologies? Wh which ones do we utilize? Which ones do we uh, renounce? You know, part of the mm -hmm. Buddhist tradition that I practice in, renunciation is a core principle, sort of putting aside certain things that don't um, support the aims of, of the practices and the models that I'm trying to actualize. So, mm -hmm. Um, so then the question becomes, for, for me now, now that we're living in the 21st mm -hmm. century and we're dealing with categories of technology that have never existed before, that mm -hmm. enable all kinds of possibilities uh, that, have ne that were never possible before, how do people who have an interest in that sort of thing today relate with these technologies? How do we sort of decide what technologies to adopt, which ones to renounce? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a huge question and I think a lot of people are struggling with this and even people that don't have an interest in contemplation struggle with this. Sure, sure. Now, okay, so I think um, I would start by, you know, I've got a section in the book where um, I interviewed a bunch of um, Buddhist monks and nuns who are you know, sort of, who have uh, YouTube channels and are bloggers and so forth, and they're sort of, you know, people like Bhikkhu Samahita, who is in uh, Sri Lanka and is a, uh, you know, he's a forest monk. He runs this blog, you know, he runs this website, What the Buddha Said, and he's a presence on Facebook and Twitter and sort of Google Plus and all, you know, various places. And I inter and, you know, what I was interested in 
in talking to them was a question I think very similar to sort of the one that you just posed. Yeah. I wanted to understand their views of these technologies that so many of us find kind of difficult and distracting, and to understand you know, whether they see them, you know, how they deal with the challenge of sort of spending you know, hours a day online answering questions, uploading videos, and so forth, mm-hmm. you know, into you know, using a technology, and whether there is a tension between using a technology that so many people find to be uh, sort of um, uh, distracting and unenlightening to, uh, to, to teach lessons about um, things like meditation and contemplation. And what was, if you've ever studied anthropology, you know, or you've, you've done interviews, sometimes when you're really lucky you get these moments where you ask people questions that you think are perfectly obvious, and it turns out that built into them is some assumption that you have that is completely alien to them. And you know, when I when I started asking the uh, uh, asking these monks and nuns about so how is it that you manage to spend hours online without sort of this becoming a distraction? At first, you know, it was like asking, well, you know, how is it that you're able to wear clothes in a gravitational field? Um, you know, it was it, it, sort of what's, uh, what seemed to me like a perfectly reasonable question was one that I really had to unpack for them. And they're, you know, universally, they turn the question around. Um, you know, why is it that you think that the distraction comes from the technology? And their argument was, you know, sort of actually, sort of the monkey mind is itself a far greater engine of distraction than any external technology. Right, any ex sort of any external thing, and that once you understand that sort of the sort of that exter- that you know spending hours playing video poker or sort of watching cats on YouTube is not just a kind of inevitable consequence of you know human evolution, sort of you know up you know sort of you know, an expression of our ancient caveman desire to closely watch furry things, presumably as a prelude to, you know, killing and eating them, um, but rather probably reflects other kinds of dissatisfactions in our lives rather than um, sort of, uh, than reflects a, sort of a love of shiny, blinky internet things. Once you see that, then the problem resolves itself. And I think that this is, it, it, it may not be a kind of position that everyone can take, but I think it is a really powerful one. And you know, ultimately what the argument is, is that distraction doesn't come from technology, distraction comes from within. And that you deal with it the same way that you've dealt with distractions you know, that, you know, for the last 2,500 years. You know, as you you know you said earlier about uh, you know throw away a bit about uh, the history you know the history of contemplation, and it is you know it's not something that uh, that historians or even historians of religion have spent a huge amount of time on, but there is you know, sort of contemplative practices really do have a history, and you know the first organized ones all emerge the first organized you know sort of formal public systems all emerge within, you know, within a couple hundred years of each other during what Carl Jaspers called the Axial Age, right? And, you know, you had a guest on a couple weeks ago that was talking about the Axial Age. And this, and you know, whether you're talking about sort of Greek philosophy or, you know, Buddhism or sort of the, you know, the, the Jewish Essenes or um, you know, sort of early sort of church, you know, were early monastic, you know, the, the the desert fathers and early Christianity. These are practices that you know developed in a world that was experiencing you know, wrenching political change, that was in the process of urbanizing, that was seeing the growth of global trade. In other words, in its own way, it was a world that was changing very quickly, much in the same way that our world is. And so 
contemplative pra contemplative practices sort of emerged at a time that bears no small resemblance to today's world. And indeed, I think you can argue, and frankly, I hope one day in a future big book on sort of the history, sort of the history of contemplation and sort of the extended mind, I will be able to argue that there is a kind of twin history between the growing complexity of civilizations and the develop, you know, and innovations and technology that are sort of that have sort of regular responses in contemplative practices. And so I would argue that what we're that what the, the distraction addiction is part of, as well as other work by other sort of people who are interested in the intersection of contemplation and technology, is an effort to figure out how sort of to meet these old challenges yet again um, with you know some time sort of applied to new environments and new tools. Um, now, as for the practical question of you know how you go about dealing with this, how do you you know how do you go about meeting these challenges, and are there things that sort of contemplatives can do or contemplatives should feel obliged to think about and do that maybe sort of the rest of us who are just trying to get control of our inbox don't need to think about so much. That's a really interesting question, and I think that you know, part of what I do in the distraction addiction is try to outline the things that you need to think about, the things you need to try to do in order to get back control of what I call your extended mind, that kind of amalgam of sort of brain and technology and sort of you know, carbon and silicon that um, I think reasonably can be said to define who you are. And part of it is I think recognizing the degree to which we our relationships with information technologies you know, define who we are as a species. You know, human history, you know, human beings are inseparable from technologies. You know, going back several million years ago to the formation of you know, the of the first you know the first stone axes. Um, now, I've held one of these things in my hand, you know, this million-year-old hand axe, and, the inc and it's incredible how well it still conforms to the hand. The thing is still sharp. You know, sort of, I can't imagine anything that I own being useful a million years from now or even you know, surviving in a million years, but this thing does. You know, this thing has. And, we, you know, and our, you know, our bodies have evolved, our cognitive capabilities have evolved, with an assumption that we will have certain kinds of technologies like cooked food, clothing, weapons available to us. You know, we eat, you know, to take one really simple example, we eat more meat than our, you know, than our sort of chimpanzee or gorilla cousins, but we have, you know, sort of our teeth are a lot less sharp, our jaws are weaker, um, our digestive systems are less robust. So. You know, what explains this? Well, the explanation is we've evolved to eat cooked meat. Now, and for the last million or so years, we've had access to weapons and a fire, which, is, which have allowed us to increase the amount of protein that we consume and to consume it in a way or to prepare it in a way that makes it a lot easier to chew and digest. And so... I, the literal shapes of our faces, the size of our jaws, reflect sort of a million-year relationship with technology. And part of what has come with this is an ability to kind of to develop intimate and incredibly meaningful relationships with the with technologies, with devices. You know, you read. Something like you know, or if, you know, Eugen Harrigel's book *Zen and the Art of Archery*. You know, where he talks about bow and arrow, body and ego becoming one in that instant when you take aim, and you know, the shot falls like sort of you know, a cherry blossom from the tree. Um, and that reflects a kind of sense of 
technologies doing two things, and one of them extending our capability, our physical capabilities, or sometimes our cognitive capabilities. But secondly, that extension being something that is incredibly profound and often very, very pleasurable. Um, if you read Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's book Flow, which is one of the great classic books of, in sort of, I guess what is now called happiness psycho the psychology of happiness, one of the really interesting things about flow states is how often they involve using some kind of device. You know, whether it is you know, at the chessboard or it's doing surgery or riding a motorcycle or flying an airplane, very, very often um, the flow states that Ruchik sent me highs subjects found gave meaning to their lives sort of happened when they were using things. And I, th and I think this, uh, there is, I think this is not an accident. Um, nor is it something that I would say that we should um, turn away from or renounce. Um, so the challenge is not to figure out how to you know, excise technologies from our lives, but how to learn to redesign our relationships with them or sometimes redesign them so that we can have those kinds of great experiences and fewer of the ones that are you know, frustrating and distracting. Now, I think also there are some, you know, there's some soft, there's some programs, some tools that already try and sort of promote that kind, you know, sort of promote a more focused state. You know, and things like, you know, the whole category of Zenware, right? Fred Stutzman's program, Mac Freedom, um, the word processing tool, Write Room, or Ohm Writer. These are all examples of software that are designed to help you become more focused by being incredibly simple. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, there is, you know, and there is an avowedly kind of Zen design sort of element to that, right? Sort of, they are, they are radically decluttered user experiences. Um, they've stripped down the functionality to a bare minimum of things that you absolutely have to have in order to get your work done, and they put in nothing else that you can use to you know, kind of feel like you're getting work done, but really what you're doing is just fussing with the margins and playing around with the fonts and, you know, moving the end notes to footnotes. All that stuff that with conventional, say, word processors feels like productivity, but really is just avoidance. Using those, I think, can be helpful because they, you know, because they force you to think about how you use technologies and how you can use them well. Um, they also introduce you to the idea that you can more broadly kind of self-experiment with or the and make choices about the software that you use so that you can or, so that you can use it more mindfully and thus become more mindful while using it. Now, to the question of are there things that sort of contemplatives ought to renounce because they are sort of just you know either because they're sort of too complicated or too distracting or so on. Um, I think that there's certainly, you know, you certainly have to think a lot, or you have to think, let's say, about sort of why you use your tools and why. However, is it the case that an iPhone that has, you know, sort of the insight, you know, sort of, you know, a meditation timer, um, is this something that, you know, you know, should you not use the, the, you know, the timer with the bells because, you know, it's a more complex technology. Well, that, and that's yeah, not where I, I was coming no. from. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, but, not, and that's not where I was no. coming from. No. I think, I think that kind of, but, the framing of that question uh -huh. might be what the boomer Buddhists, that's kind of maybe a little more <laughs> older Buddhists frame the question. Right. But, um, you know. Yeah. But you know, are there entire categories of things that you should, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that you should, sort of, you know, you should reject? I think the answer is no. I mean, I right. think the question is, sort of, how can you, you know, sort of, how can you take better control of it? You know, how can you get these things to serve your purposes? Um, and can you see in them opportunities, either you know, opportunities to improve your own contemplative practices, or sometimes maybe. Um, it, uh, or, or sometimes 
useful challenges to those practices. Um, you know, one of the one of the nuns I interviewed talked about how, and she's she's Canadian, and sort of when I interviewed her, she was studying um, in India. She said, you know, keeping up with the news is a really good opportunity to practice compassion, and yeah, that struck me as a nice example of how something that it, that approached in the right way um, can be sort of a, contempl a contemplative practice rather than a distracting one. And you know, you see the same kind of thing with photography, for example. You know, there are ways that you can use. You know, there are plenty of pe people who use taking pictures as a way of putting some distance between themselves and the world. Um, you know, people who will you know, be witnesses to car crashes and will whip out their smartphones and take a picture before going to help, you know, for example. But it's also possible to, you know, of, to use the experience of picture taking as a way to become more engaged with the world, you know, to look at it more thoughtfully, to you know, slow down and to notice things that you might not otherwise. And so I think that sort of asking the question of how can you become more contemplative with this technology, um, and if you're a designer, you know how can you make the technology itself more contemplative, yes. is one that is really, really, really worth asking. And it's only going to become more urgent as we move from you know, things that we carry around with us to uh, computational platforms that you know we have embedded here, right. or that we you know, or that we wear, um, or that follow us around without necessarily are even really being very aware of them. Those raise those raise all kinds of very interesting questions about cognition and mindfulness that um, I think many of the designers are not in their headlong desire to make user interfaces easy to use or create what they think of as you know intuitive systems or even you know to create tools that operate on our, on our behalf without our knowledge you know, yes. that that operate in the kind of background of our lives and you can uh, and that and one of the very useful questions you can ask is you know, how useful is it what kind of a life can you have when many or if, when more and more of these kinds of tasks are done mindlessly, are done sort of outside, sort of, you know, outside of your conscious knowledge, sort of, you know, outside of your control? Um, what does that do to your to your ability, you know, to sort of, Apprehend and act well in the world, um, even if it makes your you know, sort of your daily life a little bit, you know, a little bit easier to sort of to manage. Yes. Yes. Great. And I think those are great questions uh, about the trade-offs there, and, mm -hmm. um, about yeah. the future, a future of these technologies yeah. too, as they move yeah. into wearables and things like that. I yes. remember you posted a link to, uh, and we'll wrap it up here because it's been about an okay. hour. But posted. Wow. I remember you posted a link. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Uh, remember you posted a link about. Um, I think this was you. Uh, an article that someone wrote saying the body doesn't want to be an interface, and it was yes. a sort of counter perspective to the notion that. Um, you know, we're going to turn our body and, like, you know, uh, blinking and, you know, different body things into a way to interface with the computing environment. Right. Now, you know, the whole notion of, sort of um, intuitive interfaces is one that I think we ought to just scrap for all kinds of reasons. You know, and partly, as that, author's, as that author pointed out, our bodies have not evolved to have... Of, uh, to have natural interactions with technologies, and the idea that you know when you're using uh, that sort of let's say interacting with a web page, you know going to the next page, that you know going up onto the screen and doing this is somehow less natural or intuitive than doing it with your eyes, you know doing something like you know that. Um, but in some way, you know this kind of thing is less obtrusive. Or more natural, 
we got to take a step back and sort of ask if that's really so. Um, you know, the thing is, and whether or if we don't actually have you know, really good ways of sort of managing those kinds of interactions already. That you know, and I think if you know, you know, if you just look at things like the number of different gestures in the world that you know humans have for saying hello or warning of danger or so on. There's an awful lot of cultural contingency to that, right? Mm. Um, you know, the way that people will point with hands versus with eyes versus you know, in other ways, um, you know, that alone should give interaction designers pause. And I think that uh, that maybe one of the things that um, people who are a little bit more mindful about their own use of technology, partly because they want to be more mindful generally, can contribute to this is a recognition of how those kinds of apparently natural interfaces are often you know, anything but. Cool. Thank you. That's great. Good, good little reflection on uh, contemplative design and how it well, plays in. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Alex, for, uh, again, taking the time to explore some of the themes that you've been researching and writing about mm -hmm. and spending your life uh, investigating. It's really great <laughs> to tap your mind. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, too, for uh, tuning in live, and uh, good to have you here with us. Thank you. <laughs>